So we're here today with Pam Grout. Um, Pam, can you tell us about what you do in this world um, and, yeah, and what you love? Well, I would say that my number one love is writing and creative expression. So I have been a writer since I was in second grade. I literally started writing books when I was in second grade, as soon as I started reading. So I have spent my life writing about various things I love. Like I love to travel. So I've done a lot of travel writing. Um, I worked for a long time for People Magazine. So I, you know, think of someone I wanted to interview. So then I would, you know, get to go meet them. So writing was a way that opened a lot of doors for me to investigate further things that I was interested in. And then I started writing these metaphysical books. Oh, wow. When was it? Uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But again, that's something I'm very interested in energy and in how we interact with the universe, you know, our part, our, um, you know, connection with this bigger thing, you know, that we are much more than just these small little bodies, you know, we are connected to this bigger energy force field. So that's been my focus the last, oh, maybe 10 years. In fact, this is going to be the anniversary year of E Squared, which was the book that you know, ended up being translated into 40 languages. So that was, it was my 16th book, but it was the one that was a huge, huge, huge international bestseller and took me all around the world speaking about um, these energy principles. So I guess about 10 years ago, although I had written the book um, even before that called God Doesn't Have Bad Hair Days, but I changed, you know, kind of the wording of it to energy in uh, 2013 and that's when that book came out but so basically I see myself as a writer a person who um considers herself almost like a secretary for the muses or the divine or the bigger thing like I'm just a satellite dish you know bringing in these these messages these stories so I don't see it that I'm that significant as much as I'm just willing to you know be the channel so to speak I mean I don't think I'm channeling it's not like that but I you know, by showing up at my computer, by showing up as a writer, then, you know, I'm there to, you know, transmit these messages or to write down these messages. So I do a lot of blog posts. I write a lot of encouraging messages. It's just something I feel like I do for my heart. I think the other day before I went to India, I said, yeah, I just, these are just love notes and you probably won't be getting any for a while because I'm going to be in India. But um, anyway, yeah. So I'm just a writer who likes to, you know, share my thoughts with the world in a nutshell. So talking about that, can you tell us about that first time when, you know, you suddenly had this global phenomenon? What, because I've read E Squared and I loved it. I thought it was so interesting to think in this different way. And it was the sort of seeing how your reality manifests via your thoughts. Can you talk about how you even came up with this idea and some of the principles of it? Well, these principles have been around for a long time. You know, even back in the Bible, Jesus said, ask and ye shall receive. And I think the thing that was so unique about Eastward and why it became a big hit is because I didn't ask anybody to take my word for it, to say these principles you should believe this. I didn't say that at all. I said, here are some tests, some simple scientific experiments. I set them up with lab report sheets and I said, give this a try. If you, if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Feel free to write it off. I wasn't putting any pressure on anybody, but it's just like, here's a fun thing to try. So I think what I did was take, again, these principles have always been here. We've always been energetic beings. We've always been, you know, ways of energy, but um, this is a way to prove to people that we do interact with this universe. So I think that's what E squared was, was just a real practical way so people could see these truths with their own eyes. And we, what were the what was the feedback you were getting from your audience about oh, trying these people? Tests? Yeah, people loved it. I mean, it was um, in fact the reason the book took off, it was totally by word of mouth. People started posting YouTubes, people started, you know, putting it on Facebook. Oh wow, you'll never believe this. And I started getting all these emails from people that usually start with something like, you are never gonna believe this. So people started seeing all these results of how their thoughts and beliefs do play out in their life. Cause I was setting up a framework so they could actually see it. 
So yeah, I just, you know, started hearing from people. I would get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a day from people, you know, telling me about their, you know, their results with the experiments in E-squared. And are there any that stand out to you that um, that were very specific? Well, I suppose the first one, you know, just as there is this force field that you can interact with and it does love you and does want to work on your behalf. I mean, that's like the first one. So I called it the do to bides. I mean, I think another thing people like about, I wrote it in kind of a funny tongue in cheek sort of manner. So it was pretty easy to understand. It was kind of fun to read. So yeah, the first principle was the do to buy. There, there is this force. And so here, try this out for 48 hours, give it a you know, put it to the test, is this true or not? And so people, you know, so you ask the board for a gift, you know, some little sign, some evidence that yes, indeed, your thoughts are interacting with this universe. So anyway, that was the first experiment. I think once you get that, and if you just kind of surrender to that bigger thing, then all kinds of amazing miracles will be um, orchestrated on your behalf. So I feel like the sports is always wanting to guide us, to work with us, to you know, help us to bless us. I mean, this is like a constant thing, but we are often not paying attention. So as much as anything, these experiments sort of jarred people into paying attention. Yeah, I was thinking that because I, I, in the work I do when I do healing work, I heard this sort of message the other day as a sort of download. And it was, um, we're all here to help you, you know, this divine side. And all people ever do is tell us what they don't want. And I thought, oh God, that's such a thought. Um, Cause you know, people start with, if, I, um, if I'm having a coaching session with someone, the first thing they'll tell me is a list of things they don't want. And I just think, well, you haven't told me anything that you want. Right, so I talk a lot about problem state. The most of us live in problem state, which is what you're talking about. You know, here's all the things that are wrong. But I encourage people to live in possibility state because anything is possible literally anything but what happens is we just keep repeating the same old things from the day before so we keep getting the same old things i mean our minds are incredibly powerful but instead of using our imagination and bringing up new things and instead of instead of focusing on possibilities we're focusing on the same old thing we saw before so all of us are either living in problem state which is kind of the state of the world or we live in possibility state and that's where we open up to you know, anything could be possible. I mean, there's nothing too big. There's nothing out of our reach, but we have to let go. You know, the mind has to be hospitable to these new ideas. So is that what, it, when you sit down to write a book like E squared and then E cubed, do you know what you're going to write? Do you have a sort of plan in your head or are you just letting it come in? How does that work? Um... More or less, I let it come in. I feel like ideas come to me. So, you know, when I'm in the middle of a book project, but obviously the idea comes to me and I thought, you know, I like this. This is something I can, you know, spend some time on. Because, you know, once you commit to an idea, then you're going to be there with that idea. So it can, you know, use you to transmit its message. So, first of all, I pick an idea that sounds interesting to me. And this idea of setting up these scientific experiments seemed interesting to me. So... You know, so there. that's how it starts with the idea. And then you just kind of sit there and it starts forming. It's like anything, thoughts start building. Because it's like Legos blocks. When you start focusing on something, you literally are adding energy, adding energy. It's the same with a book. You know, you start with just that seed of an idea. And then as you sit there and as you are with it, as you spend time with it, as you focus on it, it begins to grow. It begins to take shape. So I would say that I had a little bit of a plan, <laughs> you know, but again, I feel like that I, the ideas were given to me by something bigger than me. And then they start taking shape as I sit there and listen and think about it and, um, you know, let it do its work with me. So thinking about that, so when you did E squared and then you is, and then was that, were people then asking you to do the next book or did it just download and you thought, right, I'm ready to do EQ? Because it's it's a follow on from this idea of the experiments on how to see how your life changes. And then I love the anecdotes you put in between. I thought the anecdotes were just amazing, which show all of this at work. I love them. Right, right. I mean, I've got a whole, oh, so many stories that I've heard. I mean, probably millions of stories I've heard from readers about things that they've manifested. And that was really fun for me, you know, to, and I still get those stories, but you know, the book's 10 years old now, so I don't get them quite as often as I used to. But yeah, 
it's it's just really fun. And I think people get so excited. Like, wow, you know, I don't have to just accept the world. I don't have to live here in problem state. I can actually, you know, interact with the with the universe and create a more pleasing reality for myself. Well, I I was really interested. Um, you you do in those first two books, I, those ones that I read. I know you've written loads. Um, there was a lot about health, and there was a lot about how people change their attitude to their body, and then they actually healed. There were some really interesting ones, and there was one particular story you did one about the nocebo effect. It's called the there's the placebo and the, the nocebo. placebo and the nocebo. Yeah. Was, could you explain what that is? Because I thought I'd never heard that before, and I thought it was fascinating. Well, what I believe, I'm a student of A Course in Miracles, and that's where a lot of these ideas come from, too. But in The Course in Miracles, it says that everything comes from our mind. You know, all that we see comes from our mind. So each of us sees the world in a slightly different way. But also, all medicines, all treatments are really placebos because we believe they will work. You know, the doctors believe their medicines will work. And because we believe it, because our thoughts are so powerful, that is how we do heal. We don't necessarily need those medicines, but we believe that we do. So we, you know, use them. But see what I basically, there's all kinds of studies where they'll get, you know, they'll have say two groups of people and one group, they won't give the, um, you know, the medicine, it'll be like fake medicine, you know, like it'll just be a sugar pill or something, but nobody knows who, who you know, the control group versus the one that gets the actual medicine. And oftentimes the placebo group gets just as much, just as good a result as the, you know, the group that's actually taking the medicine because it's again, our thoughts. It's our thought, oh, I'm taking a medicine now that's going to heal me. If we believe that, then indeed that will happen. But, you know, we're interacting with all these thoughts, all these thoughts all the time. And so we can direct our thoughts and we can believe our thoughts. So anyway, that's um, that's kind of what the placebo effect is. But, yeah, there's so many studies. Like there was one guy that um, did fake knee surgery on these people down at a, a hospital in Texas. And so half the group, he did the knee surgery, like knee replacement or whatever the knee surgery was. And half the group, he didn't, but he, you know, he made the incision. So it looked like they had knee surgery. And the ones that simply had, you know, the incisions and not the real surgery, they suddenly, you know, had use of their body again and were playing basketball and doing all these things. So it's so powerful what we think about things. It's just unbelievable. The science is bearing it out now. I mean, it's just, um, it's just such an, a thing that people don't want to believe, you know, we've been taught this one story for so long that it's people are reluctant to believe it, which makes no sense because this other story is much more positive and much more exciting that we have a lot more control over these things than, you know, than we've been led to believe. And the world is so much a better place. Well, you know, we've got a lot of forces, like a lot of marketing forces that need us to be afraid, that need us to think we need this and things are missing in our life and we're separate from everybody else and because there's all these you know powerful forces that tell us these stories it's just the wolf and wolf of how we live we really believe that this is we live in this you know scary world and that things are you know awful but it's not the truth it is not the truth we've just you know created that same old story again and again it's gonna be right back so um I think that's really interesting because even though, again, I've read your books and I practice a lot of what you preach, but just to be reminded, it's almost like I need a daily reminder to just take this leap of faith, believe in better, you know, just stop being in this box. Because every time I think I've taken the box off, I realize even when you're saying that there's still boxes in my head and it's it's so interesting to realize that there's still limitations in my thinking around health I'm I'm amazed by myself at this stage that I still haven't broken that apart oh it's a very strong belief I mean be gentle with yourself because it is so ingrained I mean think about it the minute you're born they weigh you and they measure you and you know compare you to all the other babies in the nursery and they immediately take you to the doctor you're taught from the time you're a baby, like, okay, we need to go check and make sure you're, your body is a naturally healing mechanism. I mean, that's what it does. It's constantly shedding cells. I think, I can't remember how many billions of cells we go through every year. You know, they just are shedding and creating new cells all the time. I mean, it's remarkable what our bodies will do. But again, when we start believing that they're, you know, they get sick and that, you know, they're going to go downhill, then those beliefs are going to play out in our lives. 
So I want, will you talk about the nocebo effect? Because you you wrote a story, I think it was about the underground in Japan. Is that right? And there was a, a gas. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They believed there was. Will you tell us that story? Because I thought that blew my mind when I read that. I thought, oh, my God, we can just program people to believe anything. And so we do. I mean, we, we hear all the time these stories, you know, that aren't necessarily true. And then we believe them. Um you know, I'd have to go back and I, I don't remember that story exactly because oh, there were a well, lot of stories. I'll tell you that. I think I'll, I'll say this one from what I remember because it really stood out. It was in, I think it was in Japan. They said that there would been reports that there was a gas explosion underground, something uh -huh. like that. And then they said what, what would happen to people, what the side effects would be of this gas explosion. And loads of people turned up in A&E with these symptoms from the gas explosion. And later on, it, they worked out it, it didn't actually happen right so oh, there's... manifested the symptoms of something that never took place right there are so many stories like that so many if we're told that this is going to happen then of course this is going to happen because that's how strong our minds are and it's such a part of like i said everything we think and believe that's just the world we live in we have created this world you know i talk a lot about quantum physics and what happens is we collapse the way you know the world is energy that's what it is we're all just ways of energy and then once we observe things a certain way it collapses the way to turn into something solid for a particular story and then that becomes the arena which we live in but if we can let go of a lot of those beliefs then we go back toward the wave state which is what more possibility state is and then a new reality can be formed but once we start observing something focusing on something it becomes the way our world works, but it's like a tiny little lens of what all could be possible. We only see, you know, you've heard that thing about we use like 0.1% of our minds or something like that. You know, we, we use 0.1% of everything. I mean, it's even more than that. It's unlimited, the possibilities that are out there, but we have put ourselves, as you said, in a little box and believe that is the reality of the world. And so we live in that reality. So what we're looking at then is reality is much more flexible and malleable than we have been led to believe because I grew up thinking it was just really solid. And it, the, when I speak to you, it becomes almost fluid. Well, okay, so this year, um, the, the, no, the Nobel Prize in physics was given to two or three scientists that have been studying this, you know, non-locality and what they finally have proven, and they've thought this for a long time, you know, for about a hundred years now, they've known that reality is not the way we think it is, but they closed every single loophole. So literally when you close your eyes, <laughs> the reality is not there um, the way you see it. I mean, it, it's so freaky that we can't even get our minds around it, but they were able to close every loophole and they just were finally awarded this Nobel prize for proving there's no such thing as local reality. It's all non-local. I mean, again, it's so bizarre. That's why my simple little experiments are sort of a good sort of starter kit for understanding this, that realizing that you have more power and that you are affecting everything by the thoughts and the energy that you're putting out. So if we think about that, then the news really is creating a reality. Oh, it's so sad. One of the things I say often is that watching the news is like pinning a please kick me sign to your back. <laughs> because, you know, it's showing you a story like, you know, the, the thing we thought, oh, we need to listen to the news so we'll be informed, right? So what we're informed about is that, oh my gosh, the airlines are all messing up. And I mean, I think that was a, a headline that happened when I was in India. But, you know, I, I took a bunch of flights to get to India and back and I had no problems whatsoever. You know what I mean? But the, the story that we're told, we're taught there are these deadly diseases that are going to kill us. We're just told all these things. And we believe that is news and that is information that's true. Well, it's true because we put our focus and our attention on that. So I think, you know, a much smarter source of news, and this is one of the experiments in E-Cubed, is to go get your news from nature. <laughs> nature will heal us. Nature is constantly trying to heal us. At this retreat I was just at in India, 
there was so much talk about trees and people talking to trees and getting messages from trees. And this is really far out. A lot of people can't even begin to wrap their mind around it. But there was a politician from Austria who was, you know, a very prominent politician. And he has left politics. And he he just came out with a book called Conversations with a Tree. I mean, this tree literally introduced itself to him and then told him all this information. It's only in German so far, but I really look forward to reading it. I met a woman from Japan who has particular trees that she talks to and she's introduced like her tree in Japan, her tree in the redwoods of California and her third tree, I can't remember where it was, but so she's connecting people through these trees. And I was just thinking, you know, there's so much more information and intelligence out there than what we're taught in this little box that we live in. Another cool story I heard yesterday is about this woman who, you know, was diagnosed with a brain tumor and she was sort of loath to go get surgery. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, you know, a brain tumor. So she was trying some natural things and she, you know, was putting this, thing, this, this, it's a particular uh, potion that, that, you know, you can put on supposedly suck this out. And she was putting it on the sides of her head and nothing was happening, but she had recently um, adopted a crow, kind of a long story. This crow was injured. So she had brought it into her house. So she was trying this thing. And all of a sudden one day the crow came up and very gently tapped her on her forehead and she thought, wow. And it made a little mark. So she thought, I'll put it there. And soon enough, this entire tumor came out of her forehead and she's now completely healed. And these stories are so bizarre to our natural way of thinking. And I almost even hate, I mean, I, you said you're going to put this on. <laughs> I don't know that I was, you know, really up for that particular thing, but the, the kind of, limiting beliefs that we've invested in are are shockingly small there's just so much more there and so i really like those kind of stories about bigger things and how we can that we can heal with the trees and the crows and with with our natural state these news stories are just things that man made up basically and that now we've created in our world but it's not the end-all be-all i love that sentence you said the limited beliefs that we've invested in yeah every day our the world that we've created is an investment in limited beliefs it's so yeah you're absolutely right everywhere we look from the news to the schools to how we see our health it's extraordinary yeah it is extraordinary but it's as if even when you say it i have to try and it's as if my brain is lazy and it's saying oh i've got to exercise it to even think that thought that it could possibly be that flexible that takes this lazy brain going, oh, do I really have to think that? Because you have to step out of what your comfort zone is. Well, one thing that I've, a practice of mine, to me, a lot of the limiting beliefs are in the mind. <laughs> and so really, oh, like you're saying, okay, I'm gonna, I've got to think about this and I've got to be not lazy. To me, being lazy in the mind and letting the mind be quiet is more you, how you can interact with, because you want that connection you know, with your heart and with the bigger force. And so the mind is the voice that's always getting in the way. And we all are so operated by our little minds that are telling us all these things that are wrong with us and how we're not enough. We don't have enough. There's this problem. So maybe having a lazy brain, as you call it, might be a good way to shut that down and let that bigger thing come through and let that connection with this force that's out there work for us so a lot of i think our problems in the west is that we are so invested in what our minds are telling us and we only think, oh if i can only just think harder or if i can only just you know work this out and do more affirmations and do more this or that but a lot of times i think the opposite is is actually the the way to go and then let the bigger thing do its work on us because it's wanting to you know <laughs> we're just shutting it down with our little minds our little minds are getting in the way we create these, you know, neural synapses in our brain. And then that's all we can see. You know, your brain is basically, you know, a reducing valve. It reduces, you know, the big possibility, the big waves that are out there into this little story. So, so anyway, that's kind of what I think. <laughs> you know, I love that. That's really helpful. So I, I wanted to ask you about something to do with um, 
when I was reading E Squared, and then I, I read a number of your books and went, I did Thanks and Grow Rich and A Course in Miracles, and I love them all. And I, and I love dipping back into them to you know, keep reminding me to just keep being sort of open to ideas. And I noticed that there was a, because of <clears throat> your Christian background, I think, you you were referencing sort of more, there was a sort of Christian feeling in E Squared that was coming through. And then later on, you just moved it to a sort of consciousness feeling, the divine consciousness. You had different names. And I really enjoyed seeing that shift because what I've sometimes found when I'm talking, when I'm doing healing with people is um, some people have been really trained that, um, you know, the light just comes if you're, you know, of a certain religion. And it's been, it's sometimes hard to explain that the light's there for everyone because they've got these programs around who is allowed to interact with God or the divine or source or the creator or whatever you, this creative force, however you call it. So I just wanted to talk, wondered about that with how you see things. Yeah, I think the word, you know, in each word, I talk about all the baggage around the word God. And I, you know, I think can't remember i think there were 10 things that we believe about god that really limit us so i think religion one of the things i said in um in the course of miracles experiment it's i have no problem or it, I, I have nothing it's god it's his fan club to which i take exception because <laughs> his fan club has created all these stories hmm. about what is and isn't possible so i don't even use the word god that much as you pointed out you know maybe my wording has changed and what i often say it doesn't matter what you call it it could care less it's that you use it in your life that you you know let yourself be connected to it and to surrender all the thoughts and let it work its magic within you so it doesn't matter what you call it it's just that traditionally we talked about this bigger force through the um aegis of religion <laughs> you know that was kind of how we brought it up but um it's but it, but like you said, it doesn't matter. It, it works for everybody. It's a hundred percent equal to everyone. It's a hundred percent available to everyone. It's not, you know, the kind of religion I was raised in is like you had to do certain things that only if you did certain things, and only those people were get, had you know access to this God, this you know the goodies that you get from God. But it turns out that was just not true, and that was kind of a mean thing to say to a kid. But, you know, I mean, people believe that. Again, what we're seeing in our world are just so many beliefs after years and years and years of believing in it. And I think we're on the cusp of a new revolution where we're recognizing that all these things we believe, all these things we've invested in, they are no longer working. So we need to access you know, like let go of the story, get back to the energy. You know, your, your ex exhibitions about energy, what we see in the world is things that have been created out of the energy field, but we can literally uncreate them by putting to invest, by, you know, ceasing to invest in them so strongly and open up more to the possibilities and use that same energy field to create a better way where everyone is fed and you know, has a home and has all that kind of stuff. We have, you know, created the world through a lot of fear patterns. So this unlimited energy force that literally is can do anything that is full of infinite possibilities, we have created into a very limited, fearful way. And that's going to have to go. And that is what we're seeing. It's not working anymore. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're seeing all this dysfunction because we're ready. This isn't working anymore. The way we thought the way it was in working. So we have to let it go. You, you just made me think something. So I grew up with this constantly. I think it was through the news or media or films, whatever, that everything was finite. Everything would end. You know, we were always in jeopardy. There was going to be a war. There was going to be this. Or we're going to run out of that. Or it was always a limited view. Always. I forgot about that. that. Yeah, that's how we're all taught. And that's what we see. That's the world we see. <laughs> so I was wondering something. So, I mean, I, I went off to India last April and there was something I found extraordinary. For me, it felt like the spiritual met earth there. It was so interwoven in their everyday life. And from, I felt the energy felt very different. How did How did you feel in that space? You know, I feel like, 
there's probably been a sacred ritual on every point of India. You know, there's just so much history there and there's such a spiritual energy there. So I feel, and plus they haven't had, it's only recently where they've gotten more into like the capitalist thing because for years and years and years, they were, were not into that. You know, money didn't really figure into things too much. So it's just a very spiritual place. A lot of people awaken there. A lot of people let go of the mind there and they, you know, come back. So I feel like it's a very open, spiritual, joyful place. I, I this is my second time to India. And this particular time we were there with a lot of uh, change makers that were talking about some of these issues that we're talking about is that, you know, things aren't working anymore and what are we going to do differently? But it's always an inside job. I mean, if we, we were at Gandhi's ashram. So we were, um, you know, looking at a lot of the ways Gandhi did things, you know, just a simple life and just changing within. And one of the things about Gandhi that um, a lot of people don't know, um, you know, when he went back to India from South Africa, he spent 15 years in purification and, you know, getting himself ready. Like people like we just came back and he just, you know, led the marches and overthrew, you know, the British Empire, whatever. But it was many, many years, there were 75 people and they meditated and they prepared themselves so they would have what he calls soul force. And that is this energy that we all have access to that we do not use, that we, um, you know, let it get, you know, taken away by all the thoughts in our head. But there is a soul force, but he spent time developing that, he and his followers, before he launched into all the things that made him so famous. Um, so, and, and, you know, he just did remarkable work, but it wasn't him. It was that soul force, that connection to that energetic field that he was able to access. And he spent time developing that, you know, he didn't just, I mean, you know, we need to get pure inside. We have to, you know, clean, clean the inside before we can go out and make all these big changes. Um. Julian, do you want to ask a question? Um, I'm going to ask, is there anything in particular you find is something you carry with you always, no matter where you go? Something that is um, a part of yourself that you could almost show me in a symbol. Like um, I know I recently interviewed someone and she said she, she finds herself doodling hearts all the time. It's just her thing. It's just, it's just her thing. If you could, if I could give me like a, a thing, do you have one? <laughs> Um, I don't have a thing like that, but I carry my daughter with me always. She, um, you know, she passed four years ago and I feel her presence with me all the time. And I think about her a lot and to me, she is with me. I still talk to her. Um, I think she put my life on a particular trajectory, you know, starting this foundation that I started. So if there would be anything, it would be that because I can't think of a certain thing. I mean, I, I get hedgehogs all the time. That's a little funny thing that she and I did. So people are always sending me hedgehogs, but not really. I mean, I can't think of a thing. I'm not not as into things. No, that that's um that's people. actually what I meant. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> yes. So when you um when you do you have some sort of ritual in the morning when you get up? Do you? have a mantra or something that connects you to the earth what do you what's the sort of daily ritual because you've got so many ideas how do you sort of bring it all into each day well I find it's really important to connect with the earth with the sun I like you know when the sun comes up I like connecting with the, the moon and you know just really trying to be where I am and as much as possible to Sometimes I go out, like it's cold now, so I don't really do this right now, but I'll go and lay on the ground and literally, you know, feel that force. I hug trees. Um, as far as a daily ritual, I like to, I write a bit in my journal in the morning, you know, to kind of, again, connect in sometimes to let off those thoughts. Sometimes my journals will do that too. Um, I often read my Course in Miracles, but I think it's real important, you know, start your day on a you know, on an expectation of new possibilities of being open. You know, I talk a lot about my AA 2.0 program, you know, the simple thing of, you know, I wake up and I go, something amazingly awesome is going to happen to me today. Or I've started saying other things like something extraordinarily epic, but I start out knowing that some great gift, some great force is here wanting to bless me. So I try to connect with that. And then as I'm connected to that, 
I will be led to what's my next thing to do. I mean, the Courts and Miracles is real big on don't do planning. I mean, obviously we had a plan. We were going to talk today at one o'clock. You know, there are those kind of things. But if you just let yourself be guided by how the universe wants to work through you, then kind of amazing things can happen. So I do a lot of that, you know, just connecting and then, you know, trying to be present in whatever is presented to me, so to speak. Well, do you have another question? I'm fine. That this is amazing. Um, so I'm. So what? What's your next steps? What What do you want to do next? Because when I listen to you, I keep thinking, if only you could be teaching huge rooms of people to sort of have this unlimited thinking, we could change the world just through our, just by starting to think it different. Well, I think that's true, but I don't really see myself as a teacher per se you know like speaking that's not my I mean my gift is writing like everything I need to say is in my books or need to say and in my blog posts I mean I've got like a thousand different blog posts and I think that I you know I'm expressing these ideas there so that's more how I do it um so yeah getting up in front of people like even this interview is like well this is I don't know I'm just not as that's just not I'm not as good as expressing myself in that way as I am through my writing um, but I do think these ideas are very important. I always say this is the only conversation that matters. And so I do have a commitment that when I, you know, walk into any room, I want to have this conversation, not the conversation about, you know, like it's up to me to break that cycle of negativity. You know, I, I don't want that chain to keep going through me. You know, it's, there's a chain out there. So my hope is that I can break that chain. I can stop that chain of negativity and to bring what, these ideas to people to whoever I happen to see but again I read more people you know through my words in writing than I probably do in speaking to thousands of people like you said that's not my my thing and I mean again if that's what the universe wants me to do I will I'll do it you know I'll be have to work on my speaking and do all that but that's again that's just not my my particular love or interest but I was just thinking more that you're if only we even if it's not through you we could get your words out to mm -hmm. many but I suppose you're doing that through your books I just it wouldn't it be amazing if these thoughts were taught in schools you know wouldn't it be amazing if unlimited thinking was taught as part of a curriculum it's just it's that more of that mindset of how do we start with the young to not be limited right from the beginning because it's almost like they're packaged into smaller and smaller limitations and your your way of seeing is just makes things bigger and bigger so it's it's that gift that you have of seeing it would be lovely if it could be just everywhere okay well you know what i would say to that is that i feel like kids know this unlimited thing coming in and i think if we could do anything it would be to not teach them our limitations and our separation that we do i mean that's what happens again the baby you know you just look in the face of a baby they're totally connected to everything but very quickly we teach them you know, all these things. And so that's where it could begin. I mean, I think for me, where I'm at right now, I feel like as I change myself, as I open to these possibilities, then the world that I see out there will be, you know, I'll, I'll see more of that. So I feel like, you know, I mean, and that's what Gandhi said. Of course, you know, I'm just back from this retreat. So of course, this is what I'm thinking about. But, um, I want to purify and change my own inner energy field, you know, in here. And then what I will see out there is a hologram of what's in here. I mean, that's what I really believe. And I do know that anything is possible. And I just want to be open. I don't want to put any of my old thoughts, my old baggage, any of the beliefs that I was trained. We live in this paradigm of limitation and separation. And it's not even the state of the world. It's not even the truth. I tell the story in one of my books, I don't know if you remember, but where the little kid goes into his, you know, the, the parents have a new baby and the little brother's like, I, I want to talk to my baby sister alone. And please, I need this special time with my baby sister. And the parents are like, oh, they've read all the books about sibling rivalry. And they're like, why does he want to have this alone time with his baby sister? But finally, he was so adamant that he needed this that they let him go into the nursery, you know, his little baby sister's there in the crib and he leans over and he goes, tell me about God. I'm starting to forget. Mm. And to me, that is, that's the essence. You know, we know this deep in our heart. We know this, but we've 
we put this overlay of all these limitations and all this story. And so we've covered it up. But I feel like, again, the good news is it's not working the old way, the way the overlay that we put on top of the truth. So we're going to have to access the truth. We're going to have to go into the inner and the possibility. And then, um, and then we'll see what kind of world we can create, what kind of beautiful life. I mean, if you, I just think, I mean, the world is so beautiful. I mean, the odds that we get to be here, right? I mean, what are the odds, you know, that we're here sitting on this planet with all these opportunities? It's, it's kind of remarkable. And gratitude is a good way to get into it, to really recognize these great gifts that we've been given. Yeah, gratitude is huge. And it's yeah. um, when people come to me to talk, that's the one of the first things I say is, well, you know, to just start with gratitude for their body. Half the time they've forgotten they even have one. So we even mm -hmm. start gratitude for their feet and their ankles. We just start mm -hmm. there. And then I get them to do, you know, a week of just being grateful. And it's, and, and you know, I have to remind myself of the same thing. It's just all of these things, I sometimes forget them. And then the minute you say it, I think, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. So it, I'd love it if it was just everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is everywhere. I just wish, you know, what I'd love is if we can all see it and let go of all the overlay. Let the veil go because it is everywhere. It's constantly rushing towards us. It's always here. I just suddenly thought, imagine if you turn on the news and the first thing they'd say was, today we're really grateful for. And you think, oh, yeah. yes, we are. Imagine that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That could be the new news. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're very grateful to you for this interview and it's really helpful and a lovely reminder and for people who are just tuning into what you do it's a really great way to start understanding what you're talking about and it's really useful so we're going to just end on a final question is what sort of what what do you want to tell your audience what do you want to see more of what, what do you feel anything Love and gratitude, just love and gratitude and peace. And just within myself and letting it spread from here and to be connected and to, to you know, speak for that higher force. That's what I want to do is speak for that higher force and do my part in spreading this message. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>